So now we're in chapter three. We're going to look at a study known as kinematics, or a part of mechanics known as kinematics. And we're going to start basically with one-dimensional motion. We do one-dimensional motion first because, obviously, with only one direction that we have to worry about, the mathematics is much simpler, and it's a nice place to introduce our different concepts. Now, in mechanics, there are basically, um, at least in classical mechanics, two different um, you know, branches that we talk about. The first is statics, where we evaluate stationary objects, as the name implies, and dynamics, where we investigate moving objects. Kinematics is basically the part of dynamics where we simply just talk about how things are moving. We don't talk about why things move. That comes later on when we talk about Newton's laws of motion. In kinematics, the important quantities are displacement, which talks about how much your position changes, velocity, which is the rate at which the displacement changes, and acceleration, which is the rate at which the velocity changes. These are very much connected to one another, and Newton actually invented calculus to create, create a relationship between each of these. We'll find that if you study calculus, velocity is actually the rate of change of displacement as a function of time, so it's the first derivative. Acceleration actually is the second derivative of position and displacement as a function of time. So again, very, very important quantities to talk about. We are not talking about why things move. We are talking about basically how they are moving. Now, in terms of the study of mechanics, um, mechanics has been around for a very long time in Sumeria and Egypt. Most of the mechanics that they were worried about was mainly the motion of the heavy, heavenly bodies, and a lot of this was explained through uh, mystical uh, you know, explanations. The Greeks um, also set out to understand the motion of the heavenly bodies, and they came up with probably um, one of the, the, the more accurate naturalistic models, although it was mostly geocentric. So they made a systematic and detailed study, um, again arriving at a geocentric model, but um, basically they were stuck with the technology that they had at the time. And their geo geocentric model, even though it wasn't a correct representation of what was happening, it did have the success that it was able to predict the motion of the heavenly bodies, and therefore at least it was successful for one of their goals. Going to the ancient Greeks, Aristotle was probably one of the, the greatest of the natural philosophers of the time, and he popularized the geocentric model of the universe, where all objects moved about the earth with circular motion. He had a very good reason for supporting this. Um, Aristotle knew that if the earth were in motion around the sun, um, basically any distant object should tend to shift its appearance due to an effect we call parallax. He never observed these in the stars, and the stars, of course, were thought to be the most distant objects, which we now know they are. Um, at least they didn't know about galaxies and, and whatnot. But without the parallax, Aristotle could not uh, support the idea that the Earth moved, so he basically reasoned that the Earth was stationary and that everything went around it. Again, not the correct model, but really the wrong reason for the, the wrong model for the right reasons. So here's our basic geometric mo geocentric model. And the reason why this was so acceptable is because it connected geometry to observation. We would see that the moon would go around the earth in a monthly cycle. We would see that the sun appeared to go around in the sky in a daily cycle. And of course, the planets had their own uh, cycle that they'd go around. To the Greeks, the circle represented a cycle or a repeating um, process. And that's exactly what they saw in the heavens. And again, uh, Aristotle's failure to recognize the motion of the earth was really because he couldn't imagine, and nobody at that time without the technology could imagine, that these stars were so much more distant 
than all the other objects in the universe. After all, parallax of the moon was actually observed. Okay, they actually saw a parallax of the moon, um, but without a parallax of, of the uh, a parallax of the moon due to different locations on the Earth. But um, without a parallax of the, the stars, this was the only acceptable model to Aristotle. Aristotle extended these ideas um, to the Earth. Again, he saw that the Earth was not moving. And he reasoned that the Earth could not move, because if it did, everything would come off of it. Um, basically, this goes against later theories of inertia, which Galileo came, came about. He believed that objects in motion need a force to continue to work, or to continue to move, more precisely. He also believed, like many of the ancient Greeks, that there were um, fundamental elements of nature through which all other objects could be created. Fire, air, earth, and water. And that everything around us was some combination of each. And that things would tend to go to their natural place in the universe. Thus, things made mostly out of earth would fall to earth. Things mostly made out of water would flow to the oceans. Things made mostly of the air would rise up into the atmosphere. This allowed him to reason why a coin would fall faster than a feather. A coin, he would think, would be made mostly out of the earth. After all, the ore that was smelted from um, the, the earth to create the, the coin came, uh, came from the earth. Whereas a feather might have been reasoned to be made somewhat of earth and somewhat of air. Anything not going to its proper place in the, the universe, Aristotle would reason, is undergoing violent motion. It requires a force to push it someplace that it wouldn't naturally tend to go, given its, uh, what it's made out of. This created some difficulty, however, explaining things such as arrows flying through the air. I mean, think about an arrow. An arrow is pushed by the bow only when it's in contact with the bow. Once it leaves the bow, there's nothing to push it. It should fall to the, the ground right after that. But Aristotle reasoned that the arrow would keep moving because the air that it displaced as it moved forward would come out behind it and push it. Although this is not really the strongest explanation for this effect. So the modern ideas of motion, which eventually came, overcame the Greek ideas of motion, started with Copernicus and his idea of a heliocentric system. Again, Copernicus couldn't explain why the parallax was not observed in the stars. Okay? But he reasoned that um, given the simplicity of having the heavenly bodies go around the sun rather than the earth, and the, easy, the ease of calculation with this system, it just seemed to him to be a more logical uh, reality than the more complicated Ptolemaic system with everything going around the earth. Galileo read Copernicus's work, thought it, was, um, thought it made sense. So he made astronomical observations with his telescope and used experimental evidence uh, using such the inclined plane to come up with um, reasons to overcome what Aristotle had taught and support what Copernicus had discovered. Again, Copernicus was born in Warsaw, Poland around 1473, so this is right at the beginning of the Renaissance. Okay? He doesn't publish his work until he's very sick because he's well aware of the support that the Catholic Church had for a geocentric system. Galileo is born in 1564. Um, he's the first to use a telescope for astronomical observations. Um, he was not the inventor of the telescope, but he created a telescope that was of such high quality compared to what existed before that, he essentially did invent the astronomical telescope. Now the problem was, Galileo spends most of his life providing evidence for the heliocentric model of the universe. He provides evidence for Copernicus's theories. 
Copernicus's book has been banned by the church by the time of Galileo. So eventually Galileo runs afoul with the church and toward the end of his life he's finally charged with heresy for supporting the theories of Copernicus. Now Galileo has a very different approach to Aristotle. Galileo um, comes up with this idea of inertia. He uses inclined planes where he rolls different objects down the inclined planes. And he observes that regardless of an object's mass, it will increase its speed going downhill, decrease its speed going uphill. So he reasoned that on a flat surface with no resistance, an object would go on forever. This strongly opposes the concept of violent motion. You know, especially the idea that a ball rolling uphill, even though it's slowing down, doesn't stop immediately. What is pushing it? Well, Galileo said, nothing is needed to push this. When it rolls downhill, it speeds up. When it rolls uphill, it slows down. When it's on a flat surface, it rolls forever because its general property is inertia. Objects don't move due to a force. Objects continue to move as they are moving due to a process we call inertia. We now know that mass is a measure of inertia, and the more mass something has, the more difficult it is to change its motion. We'll talk more about inertia when we talk about Newton's laws of motion. But again, inertia is the property where it resists change. If something's very light, it's very easy to change that motion. If something is very heavy, it's more difficult to change that motion.